Hey you, welcome to the Modern Wealth Podcast. It's our 30th episode. Congratulations to Resh and the team for coming this far. And today on our 30th episode, we've got a very special guest. She's an entrepreneur and a psychologist. So why a psychologist? Well, you hear about Resh and Aaron always talking about mindset, how we need to expand our mindset. Well, today we're going to expand on that and delve in with our very special guest. Stay tuned. Hey, everybody. Hi, welcome. My name is Hubert, and I'll be standing in for Resh, the six-pack investor and the founder of the Modern Wealth uh, Academy uh, today for our MWA podcast, Modern Wealth Academy. And this is where we discuss the three pillars of wealth building and success. And today, we're going to be talking about the six inches between our years. And we've got Shireen Olik, the illuminated psychologist on Instagram, and she specializes in mental health, personal growth, and self-development. Welcome, Shireen. Hi, Hubert. So great to be here. Good to have you. So just who is the illuminated psychologist and what is she about? So thank you for the very warm welcome. And so Shireen, right? What am I all about? I'm a clinical psychologist. I focus on mental health, helping people to heal, to utilize their mind in order to work best for them. And a little bit about this is so often we are trying to get to our goals in life, right? And we might face challenges. We might feel that there's something blocking us. And here's the thing. Everyone's got a story. Everyone's got challenges. But what sets the winners apart from those who feel like they can't get out of that prison cell? And essentially, it's mindset. So if I were to look at my own journey and how mindset was such an important part, you know, it was COVID. I was working for a private company. I thought to myself, this isn't really what I want to be doing. I don't like my job with this private company. And I said, why don't I just take a gamble on myself? In life, we're all going to take risks. Why don't I gamble on me? And so I left that company, peak of COVID, okay? Everyone said to me, you should be thankful that you have a job. I said, you know, I just need to spend this time to invest in me. And so left the company, started my own online therapy company, didn't even have two clients, right? When I left, within three months, had a hundred clients. And here we are, years later, built myself up. And I can definitely say, had I not listened to that little push that was just saying, do it, don't listen to the fear, just do it, right? I wouldn't be here today. And this is what I essentially help other people do to take control of their lives and to live a life where they feel that they are fulfilled and that they're passionate about. That's fantastic. So you basically come out of your shell, which is something that not many people can do right? So what was that trick to overcoming the fear? And everyone says that as well. I've heard that before. You know, you should be thankful that you have a job. Be thankful. But being thankful, we have to be thankful for the right things that move us in the right direction. Isn't that right? Absolutely. And here's the thing. It's up to you whether you want to play your life small or you want to aim for something bigger right? So yes, be thankful for what you have, but don't let that be the reason why you give up on your dreams. You can always hope for something bigger. And I'd say in my case, the one thing that really helped was I felt the fear, right? I definitely felt the fear. But you know what I realized? My worst case scenario was just going to be my current life. That means if I went on, I started my business and it didn't work out, then guess what? Worst case, I would just apply for a job and I would work for another company. But that literally was my current life. Interesting. Interesting. So what I'm getting from you is that when we are thankful or when we are being thankful, we should be thankful and build big and build our dreams, not be thankful and settle for less. Yes. Because if you're settling for less, you are the person that's putting yourself in that prison cell and you're saying, this is it for me. So if you cannot dream bigger for yourself, if you can visualize something better for your life, how are you going to get it? Mm, interesting. Talk to me about visualization and how does it help? In terms of visualization, you want to look at it as if you can see it, you can do it. 
So when we look at, let's say, athletes, right, they talk about how they're visualizing running that race and they see themselves passing that finishing line. And what happens is when they actually go into that race, they're already trained for it. It's like a simulation. They're saying, I've already been here. I've already done this. I already know the outcome. So when you visualize and it's very specific, you know, you're not just saying, OK, I'm going to make a million. No, you're actually thinking about what would that look like? How would your lifestyle be? How would you feel? What are some of the experiences that you would then be having? You are really placing together all of the components that's needed to have that life that you want, to reach that goal that you want. So when you can see it, you start to believe in it. And when you believe in it, you're not letting your fear run your life. You're essentially taking action. They're calculated actions, and you have this faith that all of my actions are going to get me to where I want to get to. Mm -hmm. But visualization, I've heard it many, many times. It's actually very deep, much deeper than what you, you, you're, just, you're just saying here, isn't that right? I mean, like for athletes who's running the race, instead of just seeing it, to get to the level where you can actually smell your own sweat and feel your breathing in your ears, that's when it really gets internalized. Isn't that right? Yes. So that's when you want to go deeper into it. But let's say if you're starting off, I mean, let's get real. When you're starting off with anything, you're not going to be able to get that deep that fast. Mm -hmm. So what I would always recommend is you need to just start the habit. You know, if I give you this homework of, okay, now you got to visualize and I give you the most intense things to do, you're going to feel this is way too much. I don't want to do it. I don't see the benefit of it. But if I have you start off with something seemingly easy, you know, which is, what would your life look like? You've reached that goal. What would it look like? You're just describing things. And why this is so important is a lot of times people can very quickly say what they don't want. If I ask mm. you what you don't want, boom, you have a whole list. And if I ask you, what do you want? It's like, mm, well, what? So this is where it seems small and easy. But actually, if you start to think about it, a lot of people cannot visualize their goal. Yeah. So baby steps, that's what you're saying, right? 1% each day. Yes, and I'm all for that because what I have seen is when you aim for those 20% jumps, 50% jumps, sure, you could do it for a few days, maybe a week, but what's going to happen is you're going to have a fallback. And because you haven't built that habit, you haven't made it a part of your lifestyle, you will fall out of it. So 1% each day is better than one time 20% in one year. You know, mm. you've got to look at long-term consistent results. Okay, that's excellent. That's excellent. Uh, so just a little bit of practice each day, just like uh, the coaches, uh, just like Resh tells us, do a little bit each day and we'll get better, right? Yes. For sure. Mm. Okay. Absolutely. How do we then deal with things like FOMO, the fear of missing out? You know, everybody's trading and making money and like, I'm not making any money just yet. I need to jump in and just you know, uh, get some of that big bucks going. That's what we've been promised here. Oh, that's a great question. I love this one because think about FOMO itself, right? What does it mean? Fear of missing out. The word is there, fear. So when we allow FOMO to take over, we are actually allowing fear to take over. And the thing with this is you are looking at other people. You know, you're not focusing on your journey, what you need to do. You're looking at someone else and going, why are they making that much? Why am I not? And that doesn't help because all that's happening here is you're not going to think clearly. And emotion is taking over, fear. You're probably going to end up feeling rushed. Are you going to make the best decision in that moment? No, because you let emotions take over. So my advice when it comes to FOMO is acknowledge, hey, this is my FOMO speaking. And then shift the focus back to your own path, to your own journey, and ask, what am I missing right now that's stopping me from making X, Y, Z amount? Sometimes it could just be you feel like you don't understand a certain uh, aspect enough. Then go read up a bit more about it. Learn more on that, and that helps you. But looking at someone else and going, why do they have it and I don't, that doesn't help you. Mm -hmm. What about the other end of the spectrum? Uh, outside of FOMO, which is failure, the fear of hitting that button and making a trade. And when we see red on the charts, it's like, <gasps> how do we deal with that? You know, failure is simply life experiences. And I want you to think about it this way. You know, when a baby is learning to crawl, they 
have a few tumbles here and there, and then they master it. And then at some point, they're trying to walk. And we always see it, right? They get up, everyone's cheering like, wow, you stood up. But they fall a whole bunch of times. They failed essentially at walking, right? Does anyone say to them, boo? No, they're still cheering them on because they're learning something new. So I would have everyone think about it the same way. When you go through something and you put a label such as failure, it's very harsh. It's essentially saying, I'm not good at this. But that's not true. You're just learning. You're learning what works. You're learning what doesn't work. If you have your mindset that I always have to succeed, it always has to be 100% of a guarantee, you are not going to get very far because you're scared of failure. And anyone who's scared of failure didn't get too far. Exactly right. I mean, they're the, the greatest athletes in the world. You know, if you don't first learn how to lose, then you can't learn how to win. That's what they say. Yes. You got to get comfortable with failure. And what I mean by that is when you fail, it's that mindset of saying, okay, I tried it. It didn't work this way. This is a great lesson. Now let me try another way. That's it. You are not taking that failure and saying, I am a failure. You're just going to say it didn't work this way. Move on. Great. Thank you. So let's move on to like mindfulness techniques. What tools can we use as a trader and as students to reduce stress and improve focus? So I'll give you guys a really easy tip that you can use. Okay. It's called the 333 method. And essentially what you're going to do is you're just going to look around whenever you're feeling a bit overwhelmed or anxious, you're just going to look around the room and you're going to identify three things that you can see. All right. And then you're going to identify, you're going to name three things that you can hear. And the last, move three body parts. So three, three, three. Three things you can see, three things you can hear, move three body parts. And what I like to personally throw in is take in three deep breaths. So when you do that, you are actually centering back to your body, to this frame of point. When we talk about anxiety, feeling overwhelmed, all that's happened is your mind has painted a different picture and you're running with that. So you've left your body in that moment. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is to bring ourselves back to being present, the moment. Yes, be present. And essentially, you have to ground yourself. Think about it like a tree, right? We mm -hmm. always see that even with winds, the tree is still rooted. It's not falling over. Well, some trees do fall over, but you see the ones that are super grounded and rooted. We want to mm -hmm. be like that tree. No matter what happens in life, the wind might come, these Malaysian rains might come, but it's still rooted. So when you apply that to your own life, what you're saying is, life isn't messing with me. I am just experiencing life, but I always know how to bring the calm back to my own body. Mm. Okay, speaking of which, tell us about what you think about self-awareness and how that is important to us as a trader. Okay, great question. The thing about self-awareness is, if you don't know what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, and what your patterns are, you are going to end up repeating the same thing over and over again. So with self-awareness, you're essentially trying to ask, first thing, right? What, what are my biggest fears? What are my blocks? And in terms of trading, we want to look at money blocks, meaning a lot of times people say, I want to call in, okay, X amount of money, right? But energetically, that means your money blueprint right, within your body, is it actually made for that? That means when you look at money, are you, are you looking at it as money is my friend? Money is a resource. So a lot of times, no, people look at money as it is better than them. It is something out of their hands. When you do that, you, you are going to keep repeating a pattern of you might get the money, but very fast you lose the money. And if you see this pattern happening, it's actually the relationship with money, which is coming from within your mindset, your energetic blueprint. It's not healthy around money. So if you don't become aware about this, then guess what? You're going to read all the books. You're going to listen to all the experts, but you energetically are not going to be able to hold money in your existence. Wow. That's mind blowing, actually. Our relationship with money and how we treat it. Um, can you elaborate a bit more about that? And if how can I discover 
what my relationship with money is. And if it's not good, how can I change and improve that so that I have a better relationship with money? All right. So how we'll know if this is coming up is think about whenever you have to spend money, right? So are you spending money going, oh, no, look at that bill. Oh, why am I getting another one of this? If you're looking at money from that viewpoint, you have a money block. Because if you get a bill, right? And if you're thinking, you know what? But I'm so glad that I have money to pay for this because I know that money is a resource. Money helps me live my life. You see, it's a very different energetic frequency when you look at money and it doesn't scare you. So example, you're getting a bill for eight grand and instead of going, oh no, why is this happening? That is more of fear because you're fearing spending money. You're trying to hold on to it very tightly. But when you look at something, let's say the eight grand bill, and you're going, well, I have money for this. I'm glad that I can spend this money because it's going to come back. And one thing that I love to do is anytime I have to spend money, I go, I'm spending this money and it's going to come back to me times three. So it gives me a very playful approach to money. And of course, what's important here is you need to treat money with respect, meaning there has to be a budget. You need to know what is that budget per month? What is it that you're able to stretch to? Because if not, then you're just not making responsible choices. Hmm. So dealing with money is not just IQ, numbers and figures and all that. There's got to be EQ as well. It has to be how, how is your emotional state when you look at money? Because if you're doing all the things, right, you're listening to the podcast, you are reading all the material, but you don't feel good with money. That means internally, there's still something where you're saying, if I get all that money, then I'm going to feel good. No, you are already placing money above you. So when you do that, you're not looking at money as a resource. You're looking at money as a necessity. And we want to look at money the same way that we would look at uh, water when we shower. You're not, you know, putting a timer on one minute. No, you're just having a shower. Money is the same aspect. If you want it to flow into your life, you have to just look at it as it's going to come in, it's going to go out. You must be comfortable with that flow. Mm. Very good. Thank you very much. Now, I'd like to talk about meditation and how this can help us calm ourselves and how, the, how this can help us with trading success and how meditation can actually enhance with decision making and especially emotional regulation. All right. So just to start off with, right, I think when we say meditation, a lot of times people are imagining I have to sit there for one hour, I have to close my eyes and all that. Yes, meditation can be that. But for beginners, what I would just recommend is start with one minute. Start with one minute a day. You're going to put a timer on your phone. And all you're going to do is you could either do it with your eyes open or your eyes closed, right? All you're going to do is you're going to focus on your breath, inhaling in, exhaling out. That's it. You will notice in that one minute, if your mind is wandering, you're just going to pull it back. You're going to say to your mind, listen. I'm doing this right now. I'm focusing on my breathing right now. I will tend to you later. And so why I recommend just starting off at one minute is if you find one minute is way too difficult, then what's the point of me saying do 20 minutes? You're never going to do the 20 minutes. But if I say do the one minute, you're, you're going to say I can do one minute. For sure, I can do one minute. And every day you're going to do the one minute. At some point, that's going to become two minutes, three minutes, and you build the skill of that. So why it's so important to practice meditation, especially for trading success. When you meditate, you are actually training your brain to focus. You're getting into a very specific mindset. And if you look at a lot of these successful people, what do they have in common? They talk about how they use meditation in their routine. So meditation helps you not only deal with stressful situations, it is going to help you enhance your concentration. And if you're trading, you need your concentration so that you can avoid errors. Mm. Can I just ask you, speaking of that, I'm just wondering, so meditation helps. Now, so if I were to start and do this breathing exercise for one minute and just focus on my breath in and out, 
what state am I supposed to feel inside my head? Is there a calmness? Is it a blackness? Uh, or is it a whole bunch of thoughts still running through my head? And that's really what we don't want. When you start, I would actually think it's going to start with a lot of chaos because your mind isn't used to it. Your body's going to say, what are you doing? You know, it, it's on the go. It wants to think. And that is what I want people to become aware about. If it's so difficult to just switch off the mind, then your mind is controlling you. You're not controlling your mind. If your mind is controlling you, anytime something emotional pops up, you are going to spiral with that. So when you know that you're doing it right is when you're able to disconnect from the mind trying to pull you and you are essentially saying to the mind, I'm going to quiet you down right now. So for that one minute, it's just silence. There is nothing that needs your attention except to focus on the inhale and the exhale. That's it. And does this exercise also help with insomnia? Because I know a lot of people can't sleep, you know, when they set the trade and then they're worried about the trade and, and they're lying in bed and all they see is red numbers and charts in their heads. So does this help? It does. But in terms of insomnia, what I would recommend is you need a good sleep routine. You know, so it's basically, let's say an hour before bed, you're already turning off all gadgets. Because if you're laying in bed, and you're checking your phone or your laptop, then guess what? Your mind is going to say, my bed is not for sleep. It is for activity, right? You're keeping your mind active. So try to ensure that you just use your bed to sleep. You're not doing work in bed. You're not making trades in bed. Because then when you get into bed, you're still going to be very activated. You haven't built that routine of when I get into bed, that's to sleep. Interesting. Can you elaborate more about that and how we can get a good sleep routine. I think because we're so also stressed and we're also busy. And it's a very common thing, like you said, you know, checking the phone in bed with the laptop in bed when we're doing all kinds of things. The bed has become the office. Yes. So you see, we got to separate, right? A bed is for sleep. Just use your bed for sleep. No bringing the office to the bed. And the other bit that you would want to implement is what is relaxing when we think about a bedtime routine. So maybe it's just playing some, you know, spa music in the background. Maybe it's having a cup of green tea and maybe you want to have like a warm shower before bed. So when you're doing this, you're training your body to understand that, oh, I've set aside my phone. I'm having my tea. I'm about to go have my shower. Your body is basically now understanding we are switching off for the day. But if you don't have that routine, your body doesn't know when to switch off because you're constantly keeping it activated. Oh, so it's more than just the conscious mind saying, okay, I'm just going to climb in bed and sleep right now. We've got to deal with it on a subconscious level. We need to make sure that we're relaxed enough to go to bed. And you know, it's how you said, if you're in bed and you're thinking, I just made that trade, what's going to happen there? You're not in a relaxed state. And I would actually say the wandering mind is not diving into faith in your capabilities. Because if you made a decision, right, if you made a trade, I would think that you would be confident in that trade. But if you're thinking, is that the right trade? Is that the right trade? You're actually showing yourself that you didn't trust your decision to begin with. And the more that you think like that, the more you are going to not trust yourself. The more that you don't trust yourself, you're going to keep making trades and they're going to create a lot of fear within you. Mm -hmm. So it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy, so to speak. Yes, because you didn't trust yourself. You might make a trade. The trade doesn't work out. And then you're going to say, see, how can I trust myself for the future trade? Mm. But what if the student answers back or the trader answers back to you and says, yeah, I, I got that way simply because I made several trades in a row and they were all losing trades. So that's why I think this way. So what we want to look at is what is the pattern with the losing trades? right? There must have been a mindset. Maybe it was fear. Maybe there wasn't enough information gathered about something. It was just everyone else is doing it. Let me do it too. There's a pattern here. And I would say it's more of an impulse aspect because if you've done six things and they all haven't worked out, you got to look at what is my pattern where I'm saying yes, but it's actually supposed to be a no. Hmm. I see. That's really interesting. Um, and you spoke of self-confidence. So how do we move from this state? You know, speaking to you right now is great. So what exercise can I use from a state of lack of self-confidence? And what can I do to slowly build up my self-confidence? 
Okay, one thing that really helps is find yourself a role model. You know, so you're going to look for someone, let's say a public figure, and you feel that this person is just a confident being. Observe them. How do they dress? How do they speak? What are their mannerisms like? And what you're going to see is these are things that we can mimic. So for example, if I walk into a room, if I'm having a presentation, I'm giving a talk, the first thing I'm doing is I'm making eye contact with everybody. You know, I'm not looking away. I'm not looking down. I'm looking at you. And these are just little things that we can do to build our confidence up. Another one is how we speak to ourselves. If we didn't grow up hearing, you are good enough, you can do it, I believe in you, then guess what? There's always going to be that voice within our mind that's saying, are you sure you can do it? Are you sure? And that doesn't help. So when we want to build confidence, you need to look in the mirror every day and say to yourself, I can do it. I was born for this. This is the role that I was meant to play. And the more you hear that, I'm, I'll be honest, day one, day five, day six, you probably don't believe it at all. You're like, what is she talking about? But by two weeks, three weeks, you will start to believe it at least 1%. And guess mm -hmm. what? If you believe it 1%, if you keep going, you're going to build it, right? 20%, 50%, 100%. So that would be the number one thing that I would say people must do speak to yourself and give yourself those words of confidence so that you can build your confidence. So there's truth to it when they say fake it till you make it. <laughs> fake it till you make it for sure. Because I can tell you there have been so many times where I've walked into a meeting and I was anxious, but I just said to myself, I was made to give this talk. I was made to do this. And every time I leave, people go, you were amazing. And I'm like, really? I was really anxious. They said, we couldn't tell. So fake it till you make it, but also make sure that you're working on the aspect where, where you feel that there's a block because you want to ask, why don't I quite believe it yet, right? The end goal is to feel confident. Hmm. Now, that's really interesting. That's something I want to pick up on. Um, how people uh, try things out once, twice, three times, and then they say it doesn't work. They're giving up too fast sometimes. Because I'll be honest, there have been a few times where maybe I've held certain events. And you know what? One person showed up. Okay, one. And I thought to myself, mm, let me try again. Tried again. One person showed up again. And I thought, you know what? Let me try again. Tried again. This time it was fully sold out. So sometimes the thing is, you need time to learn what works and what doesn't work. But if you take every failure as this isn't for you, then you are the person that's giving up too fast. At the same time, you must learn what you need to throw in the towel for, right? Like what is a loss? Where can we see this isn't working out? I got to walk away. But where are you able to see that more work is needed? That's all. It just needs a bit more of time to flourish. So that's something that you can only build the more that you start to have these experiences. Mm. It's interesting when you say that, When you, I, I've heard all that you said, and suddenly this phrase came to my mind, which I've heard before, the valley of despair, how you're in there and how do you get out? Absolutely. You know, sometimes you're just looking around you, you feel like this just isn't for me. And what do you need to do? It's to also just take your control back over the situation. So when things seem like it's not going to work out, just that one more time that we get up could be that one time we succeed. Is that right? Absolutely. And, you know, just to share a little bit about this, uh, this year, I'm actually celebrating eight years of sobriety. And before I got sober, I failed at it probably 35 times, you know, and the last time that I said, I'm just going to try one more time. That was the time that I was successful and eight years sober today. Mm, interesting. I had a bad habit. I won't say what bad habit it is, but uh, it's really one of those bad habits. And 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 it took me like five times. Mm -hmm. I quit five times and now finally I stopped and I don't feel the urge to go back. So I identify with you. Exactly. And you see how that's so important, right? That inner voice needs to have that courage to say, 
okay, it didn't work out, but what if we just try again? Because also don't forget, a lot of times when we look at something as a failure, there was a reason why it didn't work out. It could have been the discipline, it could have been impulse, whatever it is, it's just saying this is something that we have to work on, build ourselves to be better at it, and then we can succeed. Okay, good. Let's talk about overcoming anxiety and burnout as well. Because before we get to the success, we've got to keep trying and doing. And there are times when we say, oh my God, this is way too much for me. I can't deal with this anymore. So what are the strategies, simple strategies that we can use on a daily basis for managing stress and also maintaining a work-life balance? This is a great question because so often people overlook this aspect. And you know what I love about it is, it's the balance. I, I can honestly say when you have a balance in life, everything works very easily. But when you feel that you are stressed or overwhelmed, then guess what? Things are not going to go well for you because you're not operating from your best state. So a few easy things that we can do just to overcome anxiety and to manage our stress. First one, get enough sleep. This is so important because when you do not get enough sleep, you essentially are not able to heal your body. You're not able to get your best rest and you cannot show up as your best self. So make it a point to start investing in your sleep habits, your sleep routine, because this is a life changer. And for number two, take regular breaks. Like I get it, everyone's busy in a day, but in one hour, try to just set aside five minutes five minutes for either just breathing in and out, five minutes, just look at the sky, whatever it is, just a little pause in your day, right? And another one that we want to look at is our social life. When we are, get super busy, sometimes we, we neglect our social life. We say, I don't have time to meet you. I don't have time for this. I don't have time for that. And you make work everything. So there's already an imbalance there. So make time to maintain a social life. If you do not have time to meet someone once a week, at least make it a point to schedule them in once a month, right? So like for friendships example, yeah, I get it. We are all busy. Maybe we cannot do daily meets, but once every two to three weeks, I would say is doable and you have to make it a priority. Two other aspects, which sounds easy, but we often overlook our food, exercise, so important. When you are eating a lot of, let's say, processed foods, a lot of sugar, do you think that that's going to put your mind and body at its best state? No, you're going to have a lot of energy peaks where you feel super motivated, and then you're going to have a crash. You know, you're going to feel very sluggish, very lethargic. So food is a very important factor. And I am the biggest uh, supporter of exercise, reason being, when you're feeling anxious, it just means you have a lot of excess energy, essentially, right? And when you exercise, you're releasing that excess energy. So when you release it in a healthy way, you have that good mindset to now put in your 100% for what you need to do. And just some other um, small, but I would say important things that one can do, identify what your stresses are. You know, so if you notice like, Every time I have to go into that meeting or every time I have to make a certain trade, I'm getting very stressed. You need to know that that's going to stress you out so that you can start applying your soothing techniques before you go into that situation. Mm -hmm. Keeping a journal is a very good way to have that self-awareness. You could just keep a journal for each day. What was your mood? That's it. Just what was my mood today? So that way you build that self-awareness to yourself. And of course, as we were saying earlier, meditate. Even if it's one minute a day, meditate. It will do you wonders. Resh and the coaches here always talk about journaling. And now you have brought that out. Journaling for the mindset, journaling for mental health. Interesting as well. Absolutely. Know? I've learned a lot today. And speaking of learning, you know, um, here at the Modern Wealth Academy, we're all about learning. So I'd like to ask you a question about learning because we have students that come from all walks of life, very professional people, very successful people. When they come in and they learn how to trade here, sometimes they bring what it is from their professional work life here. And they think, look, I'm very successful in that area. It should be really easy for me. What are your comments on that? How do you deal with that? And is emptying the cup and learning then a good process to fill the cup, relearn? 
Yes, absolutely. Because here's the thing, you could be a professional in one area, but you might know absolutely nothing about another area. And it doesn't mean that you are not successful in the area that you are the expert in. Two things can exist at the same time. For example, I may be the expert at mental health, but I know absolutely nothing about painting a wall. Okay, so what we want to look at here is when we're learning something new, take ego out of it. Always start from the mindset of, I do not know about this topic and I have so much that I can learn. Get excited about the learning process. If you look at learning as learning means that I don't know it. You know, you're looking at it as people are going to look at me and they're going to think I'm not that good. Then you're already sabotaging yourself. Anytime I walk into a new room, I want to know what can I learn from the people around me? Because if I'm the smartest person in the room, that doesn't really make me too excited. I'm not going to learn anymore. So when you want to trade, when you want to learn how you can be successful in this, really ask yourself, what can I learn from the people around me? What are the strengths that I see in them that I would like to adopt for myself? Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Shireen. Today, we've been speaking to Shireen on the MWA podcast. We've been talking about the mindset, the six inches behind the years. Shireen, of course, is the illuminated psychologist, and you can find her on Instagram. Thank you so much, Shireen. I've learned so much and how we can relate all this uh, back to trading and how we can make it work for our lives. Uh, it's not just about clicking the button, looking at the charts and the candle patterns. A lot of it is about mindset. One final thing, Shireen, um, tell us, when we learn to be a trader, how big in terms of percentage is mindset a part of this process? I'm going to say it's 100% here because mindset is everything. If you believe that you could become that trader that you want to become, then guess what you will. But if you do not, if you're at 20%, I think I can do it, and 80%, a lot of fear, you become your own block. Mindset is everything when we look at life, because what sets you apart from someone else who you feel has done it is just that they believed in themselves, and they didn't let the fear take over. They just said, I have a vision. I don't know how I'm going to get that vision, but I'm betting on myself to get there. So mindset, guys, you have to invest in your mind. On that note, thank you very much again, Shireen. Thank you also for you for joining us on the Modern Wealth Academy podcast. Join us for the next episode where we talk more uh, about wealth building and success. We'll see you next time. Bye.